All right, so we're looking at um, racism in the 1920s. We're going to start by looking at Tulsa, Oklahoma and the Tulsa Massacre. Before we get started, you need to understand that when we say Black Wall Street, um, a lot of people think that it was just there in Tulsa, but there were several districts across, across the country called Black Wall Street. The one we're specifically talking about here is the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So something to understand about Tulsa was that there was a mandatory segregation in the city. So when soldiers from World War I returned, um, they're going to try to get reabsorbed into society, but they are met um, with the same rules that they left with. So in 1916, the city had passed an ordinance which forbid whites or blacks from residing on a block okay, in the neighborhood uh, where three quarters or more of the residents were already of the other race. All right, and that's called redlining and we will we'll talk about that as we, we continue on. Um, one of the things to understand that the district that we're talking about, specifically the Greenwood District, uh, was a traditionally black area and it was very prosperous. Okay, um, And so you had all of these businesses and um, not only were the businesses there, but the community was also serviced by its own doctors and lawyers and dentists. And so throughout the oil boom, people living in the Greenwood District had participated in that oil boom been able to speculate and have become not only self-sufficient but to a certain extent very wealthy. So what you end up with is the blacks living in the Greenwood district were living a fairly prosperous life within that segregated community and right next door there were white residents in Tulsa that were living in relative hardship and so that is going to you know that's setting the background for what happens because you have the racial tension um, and and this divide, all right? So you have an incident in um, in an elevator. Um, a man was riding the elevator. There are lots of different accounts as to what happened. Um, whether it was jostled or he whistled or there was a whole bunch of different stories that were told. However, um, she said she was raped in between the first and the third floors. The police pick him up. The Tulsa Tribune covers it and um, it again is another example of that yellow journalism because they take this incident and it is treated as if it was um, this major incident with a, a manhunt and the, the lynchings that might be occurring. And so you had, at the outset, just a few hours later, uh, several hundred white men who had gathered in front of the courthouse and wanted uh, Roland to be turned over to them. And even though he was outnumbered, the sheriff said no. And members of the black community were trying to figure out how to help the sheriff. You have a divide amongst the, the black community. You have some of the World War I vets who at this point, you know, they're, they want to resist. Um, others didn't want to resist. They've been living there and, and they're, they're afraid of the reprisals. And the black veterans have their shotguns and their rifles and they go to the courthouse. They stand with the sheriff. The sheriff tells them to go home. And in the end, okay, we have a massacre that occurs. All right, we have the businesses burned, we have bombs dropped, we have a cover up. We don't know how many people were, were actually killed. What we do know is that Dick Rowland was escorted out of town and he wasn't harmed. The white residents try to get the land of the Greenwood Village. Um, you have Brady, who's a KKK member. He goes, like, basically trying to get the Greenwood rezoned as an industrial ever um, area. It goes all the way to the, the Supreme Court of Oklahoma. It's declared unconstitutional, and that doesn't happen. And then it just kind of goes away, and we try not to talk about it. And it's not in books, and discussion goes away. Well, then in 1996, P. 
people are are talking and talking and talking about it and, and people who had survived um, are, are passing away and so a commission was formed to study the cause of, of the massacre and to figure out how to best heal from it so the commission came up with the idea that they needed reparations for the survivors uh, reparations for the descendants of the victims there needed to be a memorial there needed to be college scholarships and that you needed an economic development zone meaning that the the government was going to pour money into that area to help revitalize it so after the commission gives its um, report the government then has to decide what they're going to do with the report so what ends up happening is the survivors and descendants don't get reparations, but there is a scholarship fund that was established. They did um, start an, econom an economic development zone, and there was the, the memorial. So that first page of the slideshow shows us um, some of uh, the pictures from that memorial. At this point, I'm going to have you stop um, this video, and you can follow the link in um, in classroom to watch this this video Greenwood and the Tulsa race riots um, as you do that you have your worksheet that's in classroom all right this is chapter 20 classwork worksheet all right um, you have a notes question which is about what we just talked about and then you have uh, the PBS video all right and that is what we are looking at right here in front of you at the moment and you're going to answer the question I'm asking you to describe Greenwood all right um, when we are finished with that um, you can come back into this ed puzzle and we will continue on so these are all words we have talked about vocabulary we've talked about again it is there if you are still struggling to remember what those things are um, we've talked about all of these as well um, you may and <clears throat> some of the things that we're reading see the term wasp that is an abbreviation for white anglo-saxon protestant okay um, the next thing that we're going to be looking at is to examine the song strange fruit um, and in order to do that um, you need to to understand what a pastoral landscape is all right so pastoral landscape is a beautiful setting um, in the country right so here you have um, you know really beautiful scene with mountains and the trees and the, the cows all right so in the previous units we talked about ida b wells and we talked about the anti-lynching movement um, you're going to watch this video on PBS that explains the the history of the song Strange Fruit, why it's an important protest song. So that's going to help you answer number question number three on your worksheet. Um, and then after doing that, you are going to listen to this song. By Billie Holiday um, called Strange Fruit and as you listen to the words okay so you have your lyrics here you think about what we um, what we listen to in the video all right remember that it tells you in the video that the members of Congress were all sent these lyrics in trying to get an anti-lynching bill passed all right so this was a protest song um, so what you're going to do is go ahead and answer those questions three and four and then you can come back to this video so this um, again just helps us remember what the geography of the great migration was like there's nothing that you have to memorize here. It's just, again, the remembering, the understanding that oftentimes when people are moving, they want to move. Um, if you're leaving everything behind, you want to move somewhere where you may know someone. All right, that's why we see a lot of these patterns with a lot of people from Georgia, for example, moving to Cleveland. 
maybe there's someone you know from Alabama moving to Detroit, from Mississippi moving to Chicago. So one question, and this is, this is number five here for you to think about, but students often ask uh, why the Klan wasn't stopped. Well, the Klan members often had friends in high places. People were, were scared um, to try to stop them. You had a lot of policemen and judges and officials who were Klansmen. Um, the government um, and politicians were scared because if they did in fact support African Americans and stop the Klan, um, or come on the side of African Americans and against the Klan, um, they were afraid of losing votes. Um, and that fear of losing votes means that you've, you're fearful of losing power. Um, and oftentimes there's a great fear of, of losing power, and so sometimes people don't always do what's right. Um, and this is an editorial, again, it's primary source, 1918, trying to explain um, in this editorial as, as to why these lynchings continue to happen, ultimately asking that question, why the Klan weren't stopped. And so if you go ahead into your worksheet, you have a question um, that you may answer there. So the Harlem Renaissance is just like um, the word Renaissance means a rebirth, right? So this is a blossoming of African American art and literature and music and culture. Um, and it starts in the United States, um, primarily led by the African American community in Harlem. Um, but just like when we think about the Italian Renaissance, that it was based in Florence, there were definitely still um, Renaissance artists throughout Italy. Right? So we're still going to see um, Harlem Renaissance um, leaders outside of Harlem, but Harlem is going to be that cultural um, city of importance. Um, the first thing that you're going to look at um, talking about Harlem Renaissance, our, kind of our introduction, is um, a poem by Walter Dean Myers. And it's a celebration of the history of Harlem, the celebration of its citizens, the celebration of its religion and music and poets and authors and everything that made it um, a hub for the Harlem Renaissance. It also um, transcends that. It's also later on is going to become a hub for the civil rights movement and, and African and American culture in, uh, in general. All right. So again, um, you're going to use your worksheet and those links in there to get you to the poem so that you can answer question number six.